Hello, it's Peter here. Welcome to our Good Friday service. Before we get going, I'd like to invite you to gather some things that will help you focus on the story. These are meant as symbols to just help your imagination enter into the story a little bit. You may not be able to get all of them, but I hope you can get some of them. For example, it might include a lit candle that reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world some thorns, either from your rose bush or a bougainvillea or even some thistles. Nails and a hammer. Perhaps you could make a cross out of something that you have. Um, matches, sticks, or you might have a small cross, a piece of jewellery or an ornament. And then you might like to get some spices, these, this includes some cloves and cinnamon and some perfume that all come in at the end of the story. And then to create the atmosphere a little bit, you might like to close your curtains or your blinds. I'll see you in a little while while you get that all organised. Okay, I hope you managed to get some of those symbols to help you focus and that you're ready to go. It's Good Friday and we pause to remember and celebrate the death of Jesus. It may seem strange to celebrate death at this time. The subject of death is close at hand and we're doing all we can to avoid it. As a society, we're in lockdown to keep us from death. Today we celebrate a particular death, the death of Jesus. We will retell the story of his death, not to focus on the gory details, but to remind us of the cost of God's love for us. We retell the story of Jesus' death for it invites us to be part of the story, to stand near the cross and hear Jesus speak to us. We retell the story of Jesus' death for it reminds us of who we are, people who are deeply loved by God. We retell the story of Jesus' death to be reminded of who he is, and why he died. Let us listen to the story with a curious mind and a humble heart, open to learning more about who Jesus is and why he died for us. Oh uh -huh. 
In these three readings for Good Friday, we hear Luke's description of how Jesus was crucified. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Pilate says he has done nothing to deserve death. Hear these words, listen deeply without analysing them. He has done nothing to deserve death. Let the words speak to you. How do they touch you? How do you respond?
As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Enter into this scene as one of the onlookers in the crowd. Hear again Jesus' heartfelt words. What is on his heart? Who is on his heart? He says, Don't weep for me, but for yourselves and those yet to come. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Hear these words for yourself. Speak with Jesus as you respond to these words.
It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, 
and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. Join with the people who witnessed Jesus' death and burial. What is it like to be in the darkness? What are your responses to this death? Notice your physical responses. What do you feel? Listen to your questions and speak them out to God. Smell your spices or perfume. Sit quietly in God's presence. Let God speak to you.
Hello. Today is Good Friday, the day when Christians all over the world reflect on the death of Jesus Christ. But perhaps in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, you're thinking to yourself, I'm not sure I can really do Good Friday this year. Things are somber enough with, without the thoughts of all that Good Friday means as well. If that's your response, I can understand that. Without question, these are very confronting and difficult times for all of us. And yet I'd like to remind all of us what today is called. It's called Good Friday. And it's called Good Friday for a reason. Yes, it's very true that today is a somber and sad day. Jesus, although completely innocent, was nailed to a cross and died. You can't get more somber than that. And yet it's also true to say that Good Friday is a great day, a historic day, the day which marked the dawn of a new era, the day which opened the door for people to come back to God. It was a day of rescue. Now, most people would look at the cross and not see any rescue there at all. It looked like a terrible tragedy, a failure. Jesus died on the cross after all, and the hopes of his followers were dashed. But the remarkable truth is that it wasn't a failure. In fact, it was the complete opposite. It was a victory and an extraordinary fulfillment of a long-awaited plan. And why do I say that? Because of the man who is on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Jesus was more than just a carpenter and preacher from a remote part of Palestine. Christians believe that he was and is the Son of God. At the time of his earthly ministry, people were given some very powerful hints and signs as to his true identity. There were his miracles. Among them, he healed the blind and the lame and the dumb. He raised three people back to life from death. And on one occasion, he stilled a violent storm on a lake with just a simple word of command and the raising of a hand. Then there was his teaching. Jesus taught in a way that was new, fresh, exciting, and delivered with real authority. In the Gospels, we read how people came from all over Judea to hear this man and went away saying, we've never heard anything like that. And they were right. They hadn't. Then there were his claims. Jesus made the remarkable claims about himself, which are extraordinary for us to have to take in. He once said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Another time he said, I am the light of the world. And on still another occasion, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. On the lips of any ordinary person, such claims would be dismissed in an instance. But that was the extraordinary thing about Jesus. Rather than being seen as a very misguided, egocentric con man, he was seen as a very different person altogether. Which brings me to his character. In Luke's Gospel, it's recorded how at Jesus' trial on Good Friday, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, says to Jesus' accusers, I have examined him, Jesus, in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. For the small but powerful band of men who were the enemies of Jesus, that was always the problem. Jesus' character. Because Jesus was goodness, love, truth and mercy personified. Try as they might to catch him out with trick questions and all manner of skullduggery, they dismally failed each time. 
when they tried to stop Jesus from healing a very sick man on the holy day, the Sabbath, Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And then and there, Jesus healed the man. His critics were shamed into silence. But we read in Mark's gospel that after that very healing, they went out and began to plot how they might kill Jesus. And fast forward several months to Good Friday, and sure enough, it was the very day of Jesus' execution. The day his enemies had long wished for and plotted for had arrived. But it makes no sense to us, does it? Why plot against and kill such an innocent, good and remarkable man? At the trial, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, knowing the kind of man that Jesus was, asked the critics outright, what crime has this man committed? Well, Pilate's searching question fell on deaf ears because the large crowd that had gathered together for the public trial had been heavily influenced by the severe critics of Jesus. And they shouted out, crucify him, crucify Jesus. You know, this was the very same crowd who'd welcomed Jesus with cheers into their city, it's the city of Jerusalem. And now just a few days later, those cheers of joy had turned into jeers of hatred. Why had it come to this? Well, it's because, as I mentioned earlier, the cross was not a tragic failure, but a fulfillment. The fulfillment of Jesus' whole mission to earth. It was a rescue mission. A rescue by means of the cross. At Jesus' birth, an angel of the Lord appeared to some shepherds on a hillside, took them by surprise, and the angel said to them, Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Jesus had left the glory of heaven to be the saviour, the rescuer that humankind so desperately needed. Some 700 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah had written about this mission and the death of Jesus. He wrote, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. You see, the rescue mission had been planned for a very, very long time. And Isaiah was saying, and the Christian gospel is saying, that on that cross, on Good Friday, something really important happened. Jesus died for us in our place as our substitute. He died for you and for me. And specifically, he died for our sins, for those things that we say and do and think that we know are wrong. We know it and God knows it. So how can that problem be fixed when we're answerable to an all holy God? Well, the answer is by the Lord Jesus Christ coming to earth and dying for us. We know we're imperfect, but Jesus was perfect. He was totally without sin. That's why the fact that he was on the cross is so important. You see, only the sinless one, the Son of God, could take away the sins of the world and wipe the slate absolutely clean. And that's what happened. That's why it's called Good Friday. It's the day that all humankind was offered forgiveness. But as we've seen, it was a very great cost. 
No wonder the noonday sky turned to total darkness, a vivid symbol of the agony and suffering that Jesus endured as he hung from the cross and willingly bore the sin of the world, our sin. The prophet Isaiah writes of the cross, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the sin of us all. We were rebels, going our own way, without God and without hope in this world. We were lost. And that's why Jesus came on his rescue mission. He came to rescue us. He's full of such love, such sacrifice, such forgiveness. Even from the cross, Jesus says to the crowd, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. His words and example clearly caught the attention of one of the two criminals who'd been hung either side of him on crosses. As the hours had gone by and Jesus had made no response to the abuse and taunts that were hurled at him by the baying crowd, the truth of who Jesus really was had slowly dawned on this man, this criminal, because he turns to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replies, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now that reply probably took the criminal totally by surprise. But it demonstrated to him, as it does to us 2,000 years later, that Jesus' death would not be the end of the story. Far from it. You see, the criminal was right. Jesus did have a kingdom. He was a king. And three days later, the tomb that Jesus' body was laid in would be empty. The reason? The king of kings was risen back to life, never to die again. It was the ultimate sign, you see, that the cross had achieved its purpose. Plan fulfilled. Mission accomplished. And so forgiveness, a complete pardon, was now offered by God to all people willing to accept it from that day right up to our own day. In the midst of this coronavirus, all of us, wherever we live, are being forced to reflect on what really matters to us in our lives. And so we think about our families, our friends, our health, helping others and saving lives. But may this Good Friday also be for you a central part of that personal reflection. As together we remember and we give thanks for the Saviour King, the Rescuer. He paid the ultimate price to set us free and has opened up the way back home to God. I hope you agree that Good Friday is the perfect name for it. I have a favourite Good Friday hymn called My Song is Love Unknown. It was originally a poem written by the poet Samuel Crossman, an Englishman. And it ends with these words. Here might I stay and sing, no story so divine. Never was love, dear King, never was grief like thine. This is my friend, in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. This Good Friday, I hope that the truths and sentiments that that poem expresses are ones that you want to share in as well. I wish you a very happy Easter. My
Savior's love to me, love to the loveless show that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? my need his life did spend. Why, what hath my Lord done? What makes this rage and spite?
As we close today's service, let's pause and pray. Dear God, today we have remembered the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you to comfort all those who are suffering and near death today. We pray for our sick and grieving world, for those in isolation or in hospital, for healthcare workers and leaders caring for our community, for those who are lonely, anxious or in despair. We pray for peace in families and kindness in our streets. Dear God, may you glorify yourself as you did at the cross and bring many to know and love the Lord Jesus. In his name, Amen. Thank you for joining us this Good Friday. I hope you can join us again on Easter Sunday. I'd like to invite you to contribute to our Easter Sunday service in an unusual way. Once this service is finished, I'd like you to go and take a photo of something that represents life. Then could you send that photo to Helen Petering at helen.petering at stalfreds.org by midday tomorrow. That's midday Easter Saturday. We're going to do something creative with all those photos and you'll have to join us on Easter Sunday to see what we do. Also, if you'd like to make a comment on today's service or send us a comment in general, you can do so at the bottom of today's screen. So until Easter Sunday, God bless and take care.